Welcome to the RSET training, Atmospheric Carbon Dioxide and Methane Budgets to Support the Global Stock Take. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm a trainer with the RSET program based at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Today is part one of a three-part webinar series occurring each Wednesday from May 11th to May 25th. In the first part of the webinar series, we'll be hearing from Dr. David Crisp from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. All the course materials, including recordings from each webinar via links to our YouTube channel, PowerPoint presentations, homework assignment, and question and answer document can be found on the RSET training page provided at the link below. There will be one homework assignment for all three parts of the training. Answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the due date of June 8th. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. Below is the agenda for the three-part webinar series. Today, in part one, Dr. David Crisp will be presenting on tracking greenhouse gas emissions and removals to meet the mitigation objectives of the Paris Agreement. The need for transparent methods for tracking greenhouse gas emissions and removals at national scales and national inventories and top-down atmospheric budgets for tracking greenhouse gases. The audience for, for this webinar series is intended for stakeholders at local, regional, and national levels who are interested in reducing greenhouse gas emissions to meet the climate change mitigation goals of the Paris Agreement. National inventory developers responsible for produ producing the inventories of emissions and removals of greenhouse gases that are reported to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC. UNFCCC bodies responsible for assessing the effectiveness of the methods employed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and our progress toward the goal of limiting global temperature increases to two degrees centigrade. And to scientists in the greenhouse gas measurement and modeling communities who are interested in developing atmospheric greenhouse gas budgets and working with the inventory development and assessment communities to support the global stock take process. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Crisp. Dave is an atmospheric physicist who recently retired from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. During his long career, he served as a flight instrument provider and science team member on several Earth, planetary, and astrophysics missions. He was the principal investigator of the NASA Orbiting Carbon Observatory, or OCO mission, and served as the science team leader for NASA's OCO2 and OCO3 missions. He also served as the greenhouse gas lead for the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, or CEOS. Dave, over to you. So greetings all, this is Dave Crisp, and today I'm going to try to bring you through the first stage of this webinar series, where we're gonna talk about atmospheric greenhouse gas measurements supporting the Paris Agreement. At, at the end of today's webinar, I'm hoping that all of the participants will understand at least a few key concepts. First of all, I want you to understand the key features of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC, uh, Paris Agreement. And uh, these concepts and definitions and acronym, acronyms are needed because I'm going to be using them throughout the rest of the course. In the... Uh, and as a part of the Paris Agreement, we're going to be focusing on something called the mitigation goals. And these goals basically uh, point toward rapid, rapidly reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We're going to talk a lot about national greenhouse gas inventories, supporting something called the Enhanced Transparency Framework. And we're going to be assessing progress uh, through something called global stock takes. Now, many of you in the audience are very, very familiar with all of these concepts, but others uh, will be hearing them for the first time. I'm then going to talk about how systematic observations of atmospheric carbon dioxide and methane 
uh, can support the Paris Agreement's mitigation objectives and also support uh, the enhanced transparency framework uh, of the global and, and the global stock takes. You'll continually hear me using uh, terms like CO2. This is just carbon dioxide. It's the, the most important greenhouse gas in, in, the, in the Earth's atmosphere. And I'll also introduce you to methane or CH4, uh, which is the second most important greenhouse gas uh, affecting climate change. So we're going to jump right in and have a really brief overview of why we care about carbon dioxide and methane in particular and how they uh, contribute to climate change. First of all, as many of you know, uh, we are emitting a lot of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. Primarily, this is being done through fossil fuel combustion. That's the single largest source. So that's the burning of things like coal, oil, and natural gas. We also introduce carbon dioxide into the atmosphere through something called land use change, or basically agriculture. And there are a broad range of other human activities. These human activities are now adding about 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere each year. This is increasing the atmospheric, this has, has increased the atmospheric concentration of CO2 by about 50% since the beginning of the industrial age. So we really have changed the world with these emissions. These changes actually would have been much larger than that though, if something called natural sinks in the land, biosphere, and ocean hadn't removed over half of the emissions of carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere over the, over the industrial age since about 1750. Interestingly, these sinks of carbon dioxide are not really very well known. And we, we, their identity is sometimes unknown. Their location is sometimes unknown. And they're not really very well understood. So we don't know whether these sinks will continue to operate into the future uh, or whether or not uh, maybe they'll stop working or even worse yet, become sources of carbon dioxide. You'll learn more about that as we go through the next few slides. Over the same period of time, since the beginning of the industrial age, human activities have actually increased the atmospheric methane concentrations by even more than they have the carbon dioxide, by about 160%. So uh, we've actually gone from about 0.72 parts per million of methane to more than 1.8 parts per million of methane. Human activities are responsible now for about 60% of the, the six tenths of a billion tons of carbon of methane that are being added to the atmosphere each year. The remainder is being added by things like natural wetlands, uh, which release methane into the atmosphere. Methane is a lot less abundant, abundant than carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but it's actually really important because it's a more potent greenhouse gas. Each molecule of methane actually warms the atmosphere between 28 and 36 times as much as a single molecule of carbon dioxide on 100-year timescales. The 100-year timescales are important because methane actually, when you release it into the atmosphere, is destroyed by natural processes, photochemistry in the atmosphere, uh, over a time period of about 10 years, whereas carbon dioxide can last for thousands of years once added to the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide and methane now account for over 90% of the present day 1.1 degree global warming that's been measured since the beginning of the industrial age. Reducing the emissions of carbon dioxide and methane are therefore the major thrust uh, of the Paris Agreement, which we'll be hearing about a little bit later. But before we do that, we're going to take a little detour, and I realize that even on this slide, I've introduced some concepts and some terms uh, that need further definition. So I'm going to try to do that on the next slide. I'm going to try to uh, define terms, the terms stocks, which I'll be using extensively, fluxes, sources, and sinks. These are a part of the language we've developed to describe these things. And I'm gonna do that with a very simple analogy that hope, hopefully all of you will be able uh, to relate to. I'm gonna consider a faucet filling a basin with something like water, okay? And I've got a plug in the bottom of the basin as you can see as well. So let's see what how this works. The amount of water in the basin, and initially I start with a given amount of water, will be referred to as its stock 
So the stock of water in the basin can be measured, for example, just by a simple ruler over here on the side, defining its stock. A process that adds water to the basin, such as the faucet up here, will be referred to as a source. In the case of carbon dioxide, that might be a smokestack adding carbon dioxide from a fossil fuel burning plant. A process that removes carbon, um, removes something from the system is called a sink. Uh, chemists use this, these terms, uh, and they're not necessarily used in the same context that most of us use them. But here we're going to refer to sinks as things that remove uh, something from the system. In this particular case, I can remove water from the basin by opening the sink. The, when the faucet is actually turned on, water will accumulate in the basin, and the rate of that accumulation. Is, uh, is actually referred to as the flux. So the rate of change of water into the basin uh, is referred to as the flux of water into the basin. We think of sources as yielding positive fluxes and sinks as yielding negative fluxes. So let's watch this work. So I add a small flux of water into the basin here. So I have a small stream of water and the water builds up in the basin at a specific rate. If I increase the rate that I'm adding water to the basin, I actually will increase the rate at which it fills up. If I then go and decrease the flux into the system by turning the faucet, reducing the flux rate and the, by turning the faucet, and faucet down a little bit, guess what happens? The rate of increase of, uh, in, in the basin decreases, but it still fills up. OK, so we saw this with carbon dioxide during the COVID-19 pandemic. As the nations of the world locked down their economies in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the flux of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from industry and power production and so forth was reduced. And everybody said, yes, this is a great thing. We've reduced the carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere. But at the end of the year, we found that even though we had reduced the source uh, flux rate, we actually still were adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And at the end of 2020, we still had more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than we did at the beginning. So we're going to be talking about sources, flux, so sources and sinks, fluxes. Now, let's see how the sink works. Let's open the sink here. And when we open the sink, now we're actually if, this, if the flux out the sink is smaller than the flux into the system, we will actually reduce the amount of water in our basin, okay? So with that background, we, I think, should understand better what we mean when we talk about stocks, fluxes, sources, and sinks. So now let's watch what's really happening in the atmosphere. So first of all, should note that since 1958, we've been making routine measurements of carbon dioxide from an increasing number of sites around the world. And these measurements started at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, shown here by the red dot on this tiny map, uh, and also from the South Pole. Uh, and these measurements have been going on continuously since 1958. As time's gone on, the number of stations around the world, as shown on this small map, have increased, and we plotted those up on this uh, chart on the left, which goes from the South Pole on the left to the North Pole on the right, and each of those dots is a station. The Mauna Loa station's in red, the South Pole is in blue. The number, as the number of stations has increased, we've had a progressively better view of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and how it's changing over time. And as you can see, uh, here in the northern hemisphere, or the right-hand side of the plot, we see the curve going up and down every year. In the spring and summer, as plants grow and put on new leaves and stems, they pull carbon dioxide out of the air, reducing the carbon dioxide concentration by about 2% across the entire northern hemisphere. During the, during the fall and winter, the, they drop their leaves and go dormant, and they put most of that carbon dioxide right back into uh, the system. A natural part of the carbon cycle, and it's shown here by the bumps and wiggles on what's been come, come, to call, come to be called the Keeling curve. Over time, you also have seen this curve continually go up from values less than 330 parts per million to about to well over 400 parts per million. What's going on there? Well, that's human activity 
uh, that's being that's now adding lots of carbon dioxide to the system. Now let's look at the processes that are actually adding carbon dioxide to the system. What are those human activities? The primary activity, as I touched on earlier, is the emissions of carbon dioxide uh, due to the burning of fossil fuels. This includes things like oil, coal, and natural gas. Since the 1960s, the amount of carbon dioxide we've emitted through these process, processes has increased from about 10 billion tons or gigatons of carbon dioxide each year to almost 40 billion tons uh, being emitted into the atmosphere today. That, those emissions, uh, as they've grown, you've also see little dips every now and then. This is the COVID-19 pandemic. And as the nations of the world uh, started to, to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic, they started locking down their economies. And in that process, they, re they actually reduced the rate at which they were uh, putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by a small amount, about 7% during 2020. But in spite of the fact that they were uh, reducing the rate at which they were putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the flux, uh, the, they were actually, the, the fluxes continued to be positive, and so the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere continued to increase even throughout this entire period. The second most com the second largest source of uh, emissions uh, of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere comes from land use and land use change, and this includes simple things like agriculture that grow the food that we eat, and also things like deforestation and forest degradation that you've all been hearing a lot about. Those processes actually add quite a bit less carbon dioxide to the atmosphere than fossil fuels, but there are much larger uncertainties on the amount of carbon dioxide uh, that are added to the atmosphere each year uh, from those processes. The uncertainties are larger because it's harder to count the carbon that's added to the atmosphere when you convert a piece of a forest to, say, a field uh, that you're farming for crops uh, than it is to measure the number of uh, barrels of oil that you burn or the number of tons and tons of coal. That's done much more. Uh, that, that can be done much more accurately. Now, you would assume that if we're putting in about 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere uh, each year from fossil fuel combustion, and we were then adding uh, a couple of tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, a couple of billion tons, I should say, of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere each year from land use change, we would just add these two terms together to get the total amount of, of flux into the atmosphere. But that's not what we're seeing. That network of stations that, that are making measurements of carbon dioxide are giving us a completely different story. The amount of carbon dioxide that we've been adding to our atmosphere each year is only about half as much as we're actually adding to the atmosphere through fossil fuel combustion and land use change. What's going on here? Well, clearly, there's a very large sink in the system that's absorbing over half of the carbon dioxide that human activities are adding to the system. So where is that sink? What are we talking about? As you all know, as plants grow and absorb sunlight and to form, to perform photosynthesis, they actually take carbon dioxide out of the air. Every molecule of carbon in a tree, and trees are made mostly of carbon, comes from carbon dioxide in the air. So each spring, as they're putting on new leaves, shoots, and roots, that, that mass is all coming out of the atmosphere so that we're absorbing carbon dioxide uh, from the air. Some of the carbon dioxide they're absorbing is the carbon dioxide that's being produced by human activities such as the burning of fossil fuels and also the growing of crops. Okay, so plants are responsible for some of the carbon dioxide uh, uptake that we we're seeing here. So the plants are acting as a global sink. The ocean also acts as a sink of CO2. It both absorbs carbon dioxide and emits carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. And these processes almost balance, but it absorbs a little bit more carbon dioxide, principally in regions where the ocean waters are cold, and then re-emits carbon dioxide, primarily in regions where the ocean waters are warmer. So these processes, both the land system, where we have photosynthesis taking carbon dioxide in, respiration from plants, releasing carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere, and then the ocean, 
absorbing carbon dioxide through something called the solubility pump and re-releasing it uh, to the atmosphere actually almost balance every year. And back before the industrial age, they did balance maintaining carbon dioxide amounts in the atmosphere near about 270 parts per million. As human activities have added more and more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, both photosynthesis and the oceans uh, have actually taken up more and more carbon dioxide, such that only about half of the carbon dioxide we've been adding to the atmosphere each year uh, is staying there. The questions that we have as carbon cycle scientists is how much longer will those processes continue to work as they are? As we warm the oceans up through climate change, will they emit more than they absorb? This same question can be asked about land plants as drought and fires and other processes actually modify the way that plants grow on land. Uh, will land plants continue to absorb more carbon dioxide than they emit through respiration? These are big questions that we're going to be addressing a little bit in the rest of this presentation, but also uh, as we go through time. This is, these are the questions that are being uh, addressed by the carbon cycle of climate uh, and, and climate communities. So with that very, very quick overview of the situation that we see, we're now going to talk uh, about the Paris Agreement and the, the efforts that are being undertaken by the nations of the world to address the changes in our atmosphere due to the emissions of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases. So first of all, uh, as many of you know, uh, to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change, the nations of the world came together in 2015 and put together the Paris Agreement. Article two of this agreement identifies three specific objectives. The first objective is mitigation, and the, the primary uh, goal of this, this activity is to limit the increase in atmospheric temperature to values below 2 degrees C above the pre-industrial levels, and actually to do everything possible to actually limit the values to only 1.5 degrees C above those levels. And the objective of this is to reduce the risk and impacts of climate change. This is the area that we're going to be focusing most on today. There are two other primary objectives. One is adaptation. This is uh, focused on increasing our ability to adapt to adverse effects of climate change as they do occur. Because once again, as, since we've added carbon dioxide to the atmosphere since the beginning of the industrial age, and since it's much of that carbon dioxide will stay around for centuries, uh, we will see some climate change. So let's focus on adaptation. And then finally, means of implementation. This actually uh, attempts to align the finance flows to encourage low greenhouse gas and climate resistant development. So we're going to focus, as I said, mostly on mitigation in the rest of this presentation. So let's look at why carbon dioxide and methane are the focus of the mitigation objectives. Climate modelers over time have been carefully doing everything they can to simulate the climate as we see it and have found that that not only do we have to include such things as volcanoes, changes in the sun, everything else, uh, we actually also have to include the uh, input of greenhouse gases. And what they have found is that primary greenhouse gases that are affecting the climate and increasing temperatures over time are carbon dioxide and methane. Carbon dioxide uh, and these two gases alone are responsible for the one most of the 1.1 degree increase in temperature that we've seen since 1850, as shown in this plot. Uh, aerosols actually reduce the impact of these gases somewhat by reflecting some aerosols are tiny particles in the atmosphere, essentially smog. They reflect sunlight, some sunlight back to space before it can be absorbed by the Earth. Uh, and so they reduce the amount of heating in most parts of the Earth. But in ca any case, the carbon dioxide and methane actually are producing the warming. And they're accounting for now over 90% of the observed climate change that we've seen since the beginning of the industrial age. So Article 4 of the Paris Agreement requires parties to rapidly reduce the amount of emissions, particularly of carbon dioxide and methane, uh, but also other gases uh, such as nitrous oxide, uh, uh, CFCs or chlorinated gases, uh, and, and also uh, a, a few others. Uh, to, uh, to 
reduce the impact of climate change. And this is, of course, supposed to be done uh, within the context of the best available science. And that's what we're going to be describing in most of this presentation. They're also supposed to prepare and communicate successful nationally determined contributions, or NDCs that you've heard, heard about, um, to, uh, to the global response to climate change. And they're supposed to do this at five-year intervals. So they're going to be producing new NDCs at five-year intervals. And these NDCs are supposed to uh, reflect greater ambition over time uh, and also to report greenhouse gas emissions and removals in a way that promotes environmental uh, integrity, transparency, accuracy, completeness, compatibility, and consistency. This is a very tall order. To build mutual trust and confidence and to promote the effective implementation of this agreement, Article 13 incorporates something called the en Enhanced Transparency Framework, which basically says that countries should track their, product, their progress toward their NDCs by submitting biennial transparency reports, which include a national inventory of atmospheric greenhouse gas emissions by sources and removals by sinks. So this will be the topic of most of the rest of today's presentation. So let's look at the global stock takes. The Conference of Parties, which is the group that implements the United Nations Framework Convention, the parties that signed it, are supposed to periodically take stock of the implementation of the Paris Agreement to assess collective progress toward its goals. It's going to do this, it's supposed to do this in, in a way that uh, basically uses the best available science in this effort. The global stock takes are to be actually conducted at five-year intervals. The first one is ongoing now and will be completed in 2023. So the inputs are already being collected for the stock take. The outcome of each of the stock takes is then used to inform the parties on their progress toward their collective goals. Uh, and also uh, they're also used to enhance uh, international cooperation in, for climate action. So, how do parties actually generate these uh, bottom-up inventories uh, of, um, of stocks and, and emissions and removals of carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases? And so, so for here, what I'm going to do is introduce a couple of new terms. I'm going to call the, the methods that are specified by the uh, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. I'm going to refer to these as bottom-up methods and the, the inventories that they develop using these methods I'll call bottom-up inventories uh, and let's see what they consist of. Here for what we try to do is we actually estimate the amount of carbon dioxide that's emitted to the atmosphere every year or removed from the atmosphere and we, here I'm going to quantify that as tons of carbon dioxide per year and I'm going to usually calculate that uh, using some kind of estimate of activity which might be the number of tons of coal burned or the number of barrels of oil or the number of acres of, of uh, uh, forest that may have been converted uh, to, to crops or vice versa. And then I'm going to have an emission factor. And so the idea is for, to give you an idea of what these things mean, uh, for something like power generation, uh, the activity might indicate a measure of the number of petajoules of, of electricity that are generated every year. And the emission factor is the tons of carbons, carbon dioxide uh, that actually are generated uh, for each are emitted to the atmosphere for each petajoule of electricity that's generated. So we basically have an activity index times an emission factor to give us an estimate of the carbon dioxide from this very specific source. If I then have uh, also in my nation uh, some forest and I might convert some of those forests uh, to croplands or convert croplands to the um, to to uh, back back to a forest. Uh, then that activity is the number of hectares is measured in the number of hectares of of field that are actually converted to forest or vice versa times the number of tons of carbon dioxide uh, per hectare uh, that's actually added or removed from the atmosphere through that process. If I have other processes, industrial processes or other things that are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, I calculate those individually, uh, bottom up, and then I add them all together, sum them all up uh, to produce an inventory. That's a, that how bottom up national inventories are to be uh, constructed uh, 
through the guide, guide using the guidelines from the IPCC guidelines for greenhouse gas inventories that have been adopted by the conference of parties. So there's another way we can actually make measurements of the emissions and removals of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. For example, if I have a spacecraft making measurements of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, here I might actually measure a background value of 410 parts per million of carbon dioxide. As the air is blown over the factory, I take another measurement and I see that after it has been blown over the factory, I don't see 410, but 415 parts per million, a small increase in the background value of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If I go over a forest, that forest may absorb some of the carbon dioxide, reducing the amount of carbon dioxide. So I might see less carbon dioxide than I saw, say, just after it blew over the factory. Okay, so here what I'm going to do is use something called an atmospheric inverse model to estimate a flux of carbon dioxide needed to change the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from 410 to 415 parts per million or the flux back into the ground that's needed to change uh, the, the mixing ratio of carbon dioxide or the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from 415 parts per million uh, to 412 parts per million. We call these top-down atmospheric budgets of carbon dioxide. They actually complement the bottom-up methods uh, that are being used uh, to compile this, the standard inventories that countries have to, to submit uh, in to be compliant to the Paris Agreement. So this is the definition of bottom-up and top-down. I'll be using these definitions throughout the remainder of this presentation. So in their bottom, to construct their bottom-up inventories, uh, the IPCC guidelines actually requires that parties track emissions from a very specific set of sectors, in particular sectors including energy. This is the largest sector globally producing, as I showed in, showed in the previous slot, uh, plot, about 40 billion tons of, of emissions every year. And this is from all forms of fossil fuel use. We then have industrial process and product use. This is the generation of greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, through the generation of, of products uh, by industri industrial processes that are, don't include uh, the actual production of energy. Then we come to a category which we're gonna be talking about a lot as we progress through this entire webinar series, uh, which includes agriculture, forestry, and other land use, something that scientists refer to as AFALU, agriculture, forestry, other land use. Uh, so you'll hear me using the term AFALU uh, from time to time as we go through this presentation. This is an important category because it's the second largest source of human emissions of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and also methane. It's also the most uncertain source. And so it's one that we will uh, be talking about quite a lot because I think we can reduce the errors in this particular sector using top-down and bottom-up methods together. Now, another source of confusion that I'd like to, to touch on, uh, even though the IPCC guidelines refer to this particular source as agriculture, forestry, and other land use, or AFALU, the, uh, I, the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention, refers to this as land use and land use change in forestry, or uh, the, another difficult acronym, uh, which we refer to as LLC, uh, uh, LULUCF. So L-U-L-U-C-F. Um, so we'll be using these terms somewhat inter, uh, interchangeably, but I'll try to jump back and forth and remind you that they actually mean the same thing. These include such things as the emissions due to uh, livestock, due to uh, land, agriculture, uh, different uh, then uh, large aggregate sources uh, that, that include uh, let's say the transformations of, let's say, forest to field and field to forest. There's another category called waste uh, that includes all kinds of, of uh, waste generation uh, that, that produce uh, emissions. As many of you know, uh, large landfills produce a lot of methane emissions, for example. And then finally, there's a category called other, uh, and this includes primarily things like nitrous oxide emissions, another important greenhouse gas. We're not going to be talking about uh, very much uh, for the rest of this uh, set of presentations, but is also important and is also tracked as part of these inventories. So uh, let's look at the kind of work that we're doing here. So what nations are asked to do under the Paris Agreement is to take 
contributions from energy, industry, affluent, and waste in all of these categories. So these are called sectors for emissions characterization. These are the categories that go into each sector. These are the individual amounts of emissions and removals of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and a number of other gases in each of these categories, in each of these sectors are added up to produce the bottom up uh, national greenhouse gas inventories. These inventories support the transparency framework of the Paris Agreement uh, and go into things like the development of nationally determined contributions and also the global stock takes that are reported on uh, at the at five-year intervals. So I'm hoping with this quick uh, overview, everybody understands a little bit more uh, about the Paris Agreement and its objectives. Now we're going to shift, ga shift gears again and talk about another topic, which is uh, atmospheric greenhouse gas measurements uh, that actually support the uh, Paris Agreement and the global stock takes. So systematic observations of the world of the Earth have been going on now since the beginning uh, of time, but much more frequently since over the last uh, 60 or 70 years when we've had space-based measurements uh, as well as ground-based measurements. And these observations are progressively adding more and more to our uh, understanding of the system. For example, uh, direct measurements of atmospheric greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide that we've already seen uh, can actually be analyzed to track trends in carbon dioxide uh, net emissions uh, on spatial scales spanning individual power plants or urban areas to nations or the entire planet. These actually support the mitigation goals uh, of the Paris Agreement. So these measurements can be combined into top-down atmospheric budgets of net CO2 and methane emissions. And we're going to talk more about that uh, as we get into this in more detail. Uh, and these then can be, uh, these, these budgets that we generate uh, through this process can be used uh, to assess the completeness and the accuracy of bottom-up methods that are compiled uh, for the transparency uh, reports that are being compiled by nations. In addition to measurements of greenhouse gases, we're making uh, progressively better and better observations of things like land cover type, whether it's a forest or a field, let's say. Uh, we're also making measurements of above ground biomass, the total amount of carbon bearing life that's sitting above the surface. Uh, and we're also been watching how this is changing due to things like fires and droughts and other disturbances, severe weather and so forth. Uh, and these, all of these things can provide uh, direct support for the development of bottom-up emissions inventories by providing information about activity uh, in each of the areas that we have to report on, especially this activity activities in the AFLU sector. So our ground-based measurements of greenhouse gases in particular have grown in capability over time. Uh, here we show the, the uh, first of the, of the sites where we make measurements of carbon dioxide from the surface of the Earth up on the Mauna Loa volcano. Uh, and uh, the measurements have been made here since 1958, as noted earlier. But those have been joined by progressively more sophisticated measurements from a whole variety of different sites. Uh, here shown a site in a tower up in, uh, in uh, Palace uh, in northern Finland. Uh, this is uh, a tower. It's actually a television tower uh, in Wisconsin, where we make many, many atmospheric measurements uh, at different heights along a tower that's four tenths of a kilometer tall. We use smaller towers to measure fluxes of carbon dioxide. We have carbon dioxide measurement sensors on buoys. We have uh, carbon dioxide sensors on uh, custom scientific aircraft and even on some of the commercial aircraft uh, that you fly. Uh, you might not know it, but they're taking measurements of our atmospheric carbon dioxide. We make measurements of carbon dioxide with high altitude balloons. We also make measurements of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases uh, from uh, ground-based observatories uh, that measure uh, carbon dioxide remotely throughout the atmosphere. In addition to those measurements, uh, we're now making measurements from a variety of satellites. In 2009, Japan launched the GOSAT mission, which is making measurements of carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, it was followed by NASA's Orbiting Carbon, Obzu, uh, Orbiting Carbon, Orbiting Car Carbon Observatory 2, OCO2 mission, which was launched in 2014. It was followed, that was followed by the GOSAT-2 mission and then the OCO3 mission on the International Space Station. It's located over here on this small arm. And then uh, the uh, Copernicus, uh, European Copernicus uh, 
uh, trope-only instrument uh, launched uh, in late 2018, making measurements of methane. So we're making very progressively better and better measure measurements of greenhouse gases, not just from the ground, but also from space. The ground-based measurements, like those made from Mauna Loa Observatory, shown in this plot, uh, which you've already seen, if you'll recall, in earlier present part of the presentation, uh, these measurements actually have uh, the, the, have been made uh, over this entire period of time, uh, over 60 years now, uh, and are our most precise and most accurate measurements of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We've been making measurements of methane also since the 1980s uh, from a similar set of sites, and we have very good measurements of the global distribution of methane, at least the average distribution of methane from those sites. You might notice that whereas carbon dioxide has been increasing more or less uniformly over time, methane actually increased rapidly during the 80s, slowed down over the late 90s and early, two, early 2000s, and is now rising very rapidly again. We don't really understand why. But we do have more and more stations, and as this number of stations have been improved over time, we've been getting better and better measurements from the ground of both carbon dioxide and methane, and we can look at the concentration variations as a function of time uh, and also a function of latitude over the entire Earth now, and at least get a very good understanding of how these processes, uh, how much carbon dioxide, how much methane is building up in our atmosphere on scales that vary from, uh, let's say, continents uh, to the globe. And so these measurements have been very, very helpful for us understanding the rate at which these gases are accumulating in our atmosphere. The space-based measurements complement these measurements with much greater spatial resolution, but they're somewhat more difficult to understand uh, and, and to use. And so let me try to explain here how we make measurements of carbon dioxide and methane to gases that are essentially invisible uh, from space-based measurements. As sunlight travels through the atmosphere from the sun, from the top of the atmosphere to the surface, and then back up to the spacecraft, as it encounters carbon dioxide and methane and oxygen molecules in the atmosphere, those molecules absorb only certain colors of light. So we look at that reflective sunlight, we divide it into a rainbow of colors, and we look for the colors that are missing, and we produce what are called spectra, which are shown here. And in those spectra, we'll see small dark lines that correspond to the absorption, in this particular case, of oxygen molecules in the atmosphere. We then have carbon dioxide, a, a weak absorbing band here that just very only partially absorbs specific colors of light near 1.6 microns wavelength. And then we have uh, a stronger carbon dioxide band near two microns, about four four times as far out as your eye can your eye is sensitive to in the infrared, um, that that, are, that absorb somewhat more strongly uh, the amount of light uh, that in certain colors here. So by counting these colors very very carefully and measuring the amount of light in them uh, very very exactly, we can actually measure uh, something which is called the column average dry air mole fraction of gases like carbon dioxide and methane. And what that describes is the average concentration from the top of the atmosphere to the surface and back up to the spacecraft. To derive those values, to estimate the actual amount of carbon dioxide, whether it's 412 or 415 parts per million of carbon dioxide from measurements like this, we use something called an atmospheric retrieval model. That atmospheric model includes a radiative transfer model. We'll learn more about this later an instrument performance model, and an inverse model. These methods actually produce synthetic spectrum of the atmosphere, which we compare to the observed spectra. And when they compare, when the comparison uh, yields a good match, we actually have a value of the column average CO2 dry air mole fraction, or something we call XCO2, or the column average methane dry air mole fraction, which we call XCH4. Because these estimates require quite a large num amount of work and, and require very precise measurements and, and very uh, uh, truly excellent models, they, they don't always come out uh, abs absolutely perfect. And so we actually have to make sure that our measurements are good. And so the best way to do that uh, is to compare the space-based measurements to ground-based measurements whose accuracy has been better established over time. So we do that through a validation system that makes comparisons of the derived XCO2 and XCH4 values to uh, 
places like Mauna Loa Observatory, measurements made at Mauna Loa Observatory, uplooking measurements from spectrometers on the ground that make measurements using the same basic technique, but to much higher precision and accuracy. We make measurements comparing, we compare measurements to those made on towers, on high flying aircraft, on balloons, and we also compare the results we get from different satellites to make sure that they are accurate and precise enough to, to say, distinguish between 412 and 413 parts per million for carbon dioxide. We're still not done because what that does is give us a description of the spatial distribution of carbon dioxide or methane in our atmosphere, but it doesn't tell you where something is absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or where it is emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. To do that, we have to use something called an atmospheric inverse model. And that atmospheric inverse model takes data that we've collected from spacecraft or from ground-based measurements. We combine that with winds. We'll see a little bit more of that in a minute. We use an inverse model to refine our estimate of the fluxes that are responsible for producing the observed different distribution of carbon dioxide in the, pro in the presence of these winds. Uh, and so this is once again an iterative process that we repeat until we get a very good match. And then from that, we generate maps of fluxes or emissions or removals of carbon dioxide or methane from the atmosphere that are, give us the observed concentration distribution in the presence of the winds. Now, that's a, a very complicated series of I've just gone through and I'm going to go through each of these areas in a little bit more detail so you get a little bit better understanding uh, of uh, how they're actually uh, implemented. So for measurements, here are measurements made by the Orbiting Carbon Observatory too, OCO2, since 2014. We're showing about three days per second here in this presentation. And uh, as we can see, we can see uh, we make measurements of carbon dioxide from uh, almost the South Pole to almost the North Pole. But, it, but actually, uh, we can only make measurements where there's sunlight because we're, we're looking at reflected sunlight here. So during the summer, we get very good coverage at high northern latitudes. But as we get into the fall and winter, as shown here, we get very little sunlight over the far northern latitude, so we don't get very good, very many measurements there. We also see breaks here due to things like clouds. You've also noticed the colors have been changing. The bluer colors are low amounts of carbon dioxide. The red colors are higher amounts of carbon dioxide. But the biggest differences you're seeing here are only a couple of percent, only about two or three percent across the entire globe. So we need super precise measurements. You've also noticed as we get into the spring and we start more measurements at high northern latitudes, we'll start seeing the colors go from red to blue up here as carbon dioxide is pulled out of the air by the plants across the entire northern hemisphere. Now, since uh, 2019, we've also been making measurements with the OCO3 spacecraft, the OCO3 instrument on the International Space Station. It covers a different set of, of uh, regions than the OCO2 spacecraft, and these measurements are completely complementary and can be added together to improve our understanding of the carbon dioxide distribution in the app. So that gives you an idea of the coverage and the kind of things that we're measuring with the space-based measurements. We make very similar observations of methane with instruments like the uh, Japanese Greenhouse Gases Observing Satellite, GOSAT, here, and with the European uh, Copernicus uh, Sentinel-5 uh, precursor uh, tropomi instrument shown here. GOSAT makes measurements over the entire, a, a few hundred measurements over the entire Earth every day, uh, but those com can be compiled over monthly intervals to produce uh, very good coverage of the Earth. Uh, Tropomi makes measurements over, uh, in, this in this particular uh, figure showing observations over continents, it makes measurements at much higher resolution than, than the Japanese GOSAT mission can. Uh, and those measurements can be used to characterize uh, the concentrations of carbon, of methane associated with things like fossil fuel extraction sites over West Texas, or natural wetlands like those around the Mississippi River shown here. Uh, so we can see in uh, the kinds of measure, measurements that we're taking with these spacecraft as well. So how do we convert or how do we use uh, these observations that the satellites collect? Remember, the satellites collect observations of spectra, not observations of CO2. Um, and so how do we uh, derive CO2 from these spectra? Well, we use this thing called a remote sensing retrieval algorithm. And what I'm going to give you is my... Uh, two-minute uh, course on atmospheric remote sensing and retrieval theory. Uh, you're not going to have uh, to remember all of this, but it'll give you an idea of the process that we go through. <laughs> 
We use an atmospheric radiative transfer model, which uses information such as the distribution of carbon dioxide and, and aerosols and temperatures and so forth in the atmosphere. It uses information about how all of these different species and contribu uh, contributors to the atmosphere absorb sunlight. We use that in a model uh, along with information about the viewing geometry of the spacecraft, where it's pointing, and we can generate synthetic spectra that uh, should be kind of what the, what the spacecraft would be seeing if it had a perfect instrument flying above the Earth. So that's what the forward radiative transfer model does. The instrument model then actually says, well, the instrument doesn't have infinite spectral resolution. It doesn't have infinite signal to noise. Uh, it doesn't have infinite spatial resolution. It has a particular spatial resolution on the uh, It has a particular spectral resolution. It has a specific sensitivity. So if I had a spectrum that looked like this and it went through an instrument like that, what would it look like? So the instrument model simulates that and generates a spectrum much more like those uh, that the spacecraft should be seeing. And then we make direct comparisons between the actual measurements returned by the spacecraft and the measurements that we are the synthetic observations that we've generated with these models. And then we look at the differences between those in order to improve our initial estimates for what, how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere. So we can then adjust that and go into an iterative process here where the, we have essentially a nonlinear least squares fitting model here that fits the right amount of carbon dioxide to produce a spectrum that matches the observations to the best of our ability. So once we've done that, we come up with a new distribution of carbon dioxide uh, and other atmospheric parameters uh, in our system. Uh, and we, one of the things we then do then is take this information and uh, from that uh, determine what the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration is in this particular example. Now I recognize that after that couple of minutes of introduction to atmospheric remote sensing theory, you may not have this uh, PhD level activity uh, fully understood, but under please understand that there is a process. It is well understood by the people who implement it and it's implemented rigorously. And we know that because we make comparisons between the ground-based measurements uh, and the space-based measurements to validate both the precision and the accuracy of the space-based measurements. Our primary transfer standard in this effort is a series of stations uh, that are part of something called the Total Carbon Column Observing Network. And each of these, this is a shipping container. Notice a little telescope dome on the top, which allows us to stare straight at the sun with a spectrometer that's inside this dome, inside the shipping container. We've got about two dozen of these sites around the world. They make very, very precise measurements of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere, which has been verified directly against uh, measurements made by in situ sensors, both on the ground and in aircraft above the station. So we validated our validation system, and now we use the validation system as a, cross, as a transfer standard for validating the, the space-based measurements. And what we're doing here is plotting uh, the measured carbon dioxide uh, XCO2 value uh, from, uh, say, the GOSAT spacecraft, the Japanese GOSAT spacecraft, against that obtained by the TCON network uh, of stations here over time, and we get very good measurements here. We're, we actually agree to about 1.16 parts per million uh, out of about 415 parts per million. That's an excellent, that's excellent agreement, about one part in 800. With OCO2, we make even finer, more precise measurements, getting results uh, where single soundings yield results with accuracies and precisions of about 0.91 parts per million uh, on average uh, in comparison to the TCON network. For methane, similar kinds of things are being done with the TROPOMI uh, instrument here and also with the GOSAT uh, instrument, which also measures methane. And we can track the difference between uh, the TCON measurements and the uh, space-based measurements over time in order their accuracy uh, and their quality in making measurements of concentrations of CO2. So uh, once we get these measurements, um, the um, objective, of course, is to actually measure fluxes. And so, um, but to do that, it turns out that methane and CO2, even though they can be measured using the same basic technique, they pose very specific challenges. The biggest issue with carbon dioxide is that there is so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Over 400 of each million molecules of air in the atmosphere 
are carbon dioxide molecules. So there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere already. An individual large power plant or large city will change the carbon dioxide abundance only by about one part per million, one part in 800. So I need to make very, very precise measurements of carbon dioxide to distinguish what's going on, let's say, over a city versus what's going on just outside that city. So that's the biggest single challenge uh, for carbon dioxide. The other issue um, is that, and, and by the way, it takes a fairly large, expensive instrument to do that. And currently, uh, large public sector missions like GOSAT and OCO2 uh, are the ones that are capable of doing that. CH, uh, the, the uh, methane fluxes are, have their own challenges. Uh, there, the, the, there's much less methane in the atmosphere, only about two parts per million. Uh, and a large methane leak uh, from, a, from a pipeline or, or a large amount of methane coming out of a, a large agricultural uh, activity like a livestock feeding station is, is going to produce sev a, a, a several percent change in the methane. But we, the problem there is we have uh, the, the main source of emissions of methane are weakly emitting wetlands and croplands uh, like rice fields. And they're, they, they produce also very small changes uh, in, in uh, the methane concentration in the atmosphere that has to be resolved in these measurements. So large public sector uh, systems are required to measure these weak sources, but the super emitters uh, like uh, large leaks for pipelines and, and, uh, and, and large agricultural activities can actually be measured with much simpler systems. And the private sector hyperspectral imaging satellites are now playing a role uh, here. So we can all work together, uh, public sector and private sector, uh, to learn more uh, about the spatial distribution uh, and, and uh, emissions of methane. The other point to make here is that the capabilities are increasing over time for space-based measurements. At the moment, we've introduced you to the Japanese GOSAT mission, the uh, NASA's OCO2 mission, and OCO3 mission which are currently in flight today. But as we, get into, as we move into the future, there are several spacecraft or under, and instruments are under construction at the moment, which will substantially expand this fleet, dramatically improving uh, its spatial resolution uh, and its coverage of the Earth, uh, and, and also the frequency of our ability to make measurements over the entire world. So we'll be getting much better measurements as time goes on from our space-based systems. So, so far what we've done is we've introduced the concept of making measurements of concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and methane and tracking their trends over time. Ground-based measurements provide the greatest accuracy and the greatest precision in the measurements that we're making of the concentrations and their trends over time. But there are only a few hundred stations around the world that can uh, actually meet the, re the accuracy and precision requirements to do this, and that number has not changed very rapidly over time. Fortunately, recently they've been augmented by space-based measurements, which don't have quite the accuracy or quite the precision, but they have much, much greater resolution and coverage than the ground-based systems. So if I can, if we can actually combine the space-based measurements uh, with their great resolution and coverage, with the ground-based systems, with their accuracy to improve both the accuracy of both sets of data, we'll have a system uh, that can actually make the data, collect the data we need to actually use atmospheric measurements to monitor sources uh, and removals of carbon dioxide and methane from the atmosphere. So that's most of the challenge. The next challenge is a little bit more difficult to, to describe, and we're going to be describing a little bit here, just introducing and then talking about much more in part two of this webinar series. And that's the retrieval uh, or estimation of fluxes of atmospheric carbon dioxide and methane using atmospheric inverse models. This is needed because as carbon dioxide, as shown here, is added to the atmosphere by industrial processes in the Northeast or in China uh, or in uh, Western Europe, it's transported away almost instantly by the winds. And so we have to actually understand what the net effects of both the fluxes are and the winds are in order to actually learn about either of those processes. To do that, we use something called an atmospheric inverse model. Those models combine a transport model, like those used to predict your daily weather, with an atmospheric inverse model, which is used to 
to actually optimize the fluxes to produce the fluxes need to estimate the fluxes needed to produce the observed concentration field in the presence of the winds. Okay, so we add the data, we assimilate the data that we collect from our space-based and ground-based systems into these transport models. We then use an inverse model to come up with the best estimate for the distribution of fluxes where uptake of carbon dioxide by the land biosphere is shown here in blue, emissions of, of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by the land biosphere uh, is shown here in red, for example. So we can produce maps of fluxes uh, which can then be used uh, to estimate the total net budgets uh, of, of these species uh, into, the, into and out of the atmosphere. So what we've tried to do is introduce in this section uh, the concept of bottom-up inventories, which are source-specific, so you know exactly where the emissions are coming from, and, and where, the, where the activities are easy to characterize and where the emission factors are well known, we can quantify uh, these different sectors uh, and, and categories very, very well and come up with excellent estimates of the emissions and removals of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. For things like fossil fuels, we do that very well. For things like land use, uh, the uncertainties are much, la much larger and we need to improve that. Atmospheric inverse methods uh, can actually complement these bottom-up methods uh, by providing top-down estimates that actually quantify uh, emissions from all sources uh, and basically just determine how much uh, the concentrations of carbon dioxide have changed in the atmosphere over time. The nice thing about these is that they can actually track emissions from hot spots and rapidly changing systems in ways that are much uh, better than the bottom-up inventories can. Uh, they also can detect emission changes from the natural carbon cycle, the oceans and the land biosphere, forest, let's say, uh, that are caused by uh, either human activities or by climate change. These are not directly uh, incorporated uh, in the bottom-up inventories. So we can actually compile inventories both ways, bottom-up and top-down, and combine these. We can produce, in principle, a more complete uh, and accurate stock take. So, Key takeaway is that we can only manage what we measure. The best way to manage and regulate greenhouse gas emissions is to compile and track source-specific bottom-up inventories of their emissions and removals by human activities. And this is, in fact, what is required by the Paris Agreement. These inventories also provide a prior or first guess for some of the atmospheric inversions that we're going to talk about next. The best way to to assess collective progress toward the greenhouse gas emissions goals on national to continental scales is to actually create top-down atmospheric greenhouse gas budgets. These are derived from spatially and temporally resolved measurements of concentrations of these gases in the atmosphere that are analyzed for the atmospheric inverse models. Bottom up, top down, working together. The atmospheric CO2 and methane budgets can also facilitate the development of the bottom-up inventories by showing sources that have been mis misplaced or misattributed mis uh, uh, or, or, or actually just under or overestimated. Both bottom-up uh, inventories and top-down budgets are critical to the success of the Paris Agreement. Now, to illustrate some of these things, we're going to shift gears very quickly and give you a, a quick look at a couple of pilot use cases, which you'll hear much more about in the second part of uh, this, uh, some, this webinar series. The Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, or CEOS, generated a couple of pilot use cases uh, for this purpose. So how can top-down top methods support the global stock take? The top-down atmospheric CO2 and methane budgets are going, actually going to complement the bottom-up inventories to support, in principle, a more complete, accurate, and transparent global stock take by providing a means for assessing the accuracy and completeness of emissions uh, reports on regional, national, and local scales. They can also facilitate the development of bottom-up inventories, particularly in sectors uh, other than fossil fuel, where sometimes the activity indices uh, and the emission factors are much less well-known. They can also identify opportunities or low-hanging fruit by improving greenhouse gas inventories uh, to support future global stock takes. To begin the conversation, 
between the bottom-up inventory compiling community, uh, the policy-making community or stakeholders, uh, and the, uh, the scientific community that is responsible for measuring uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, CO2 and methane in the atmosphere, uh, and modeling their concentrations. Uh, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, this is a group of 34 space agencies and 29 associates, has compiled a series of top-down budgets of carbon dioxide and methane uh, to be used as use cases that just basically illustrate uh, how they, these methods can be used. As I noted earlier, these use cases are going to be described in much greater detail in part two. We're also, uh, CIOS is actually actively soliciting input from stakeholders, members of the national inventory community, and also members of the scientific community uh, for how to do a better job in creating uh, these uh, top-down budgets uh, so that they're of more use in future stock takes. So let's take a quick look at these. To actually generate these uh, top-down uh, CO2 budgets, uh, the uh, observations obtained by the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2, uh, interpreted by uh, the OCO2 Model Intercomparison Project, uh, have been adopted uh, as the, the global uh, flux uh, data set used in this particular uh, set of experiments. These, uh, these uh, experiments actually combine data collected from the ground and aircraft instruments with data collected by OCO2 uh, to actually assess uh, stocks and uh, flux and stock, stock changes. To construct methane budgets, uh, the, the pilot uh, products were developed using data uh, from uh, the, the Japanese GOSAT mission uh, processed by NASA's Carbon Monitoring System Flux Group. Uh, and so uh, these data then uh, have, have uh, generated similar products to those uh, generated for CO2. We're also soliciting uh, observations of individual local sources. These include individual large urban areas uh, and also um, individual power plants, uh, fossil fuel extraction areas. Uh, large numbers of, of members of the scientific community uh, have been studying emissions from these sites. Uh, and we're going to be uh, very briefly discussing some of the, the use of those products uh, to improve of the inventories of carbon dioxide and methane emissions and removals. So the primary objective of this activity uh, isn't to produce a definitive set of, of values uh, that can be used specifically uh, for um, validating bottom-up inventories, but instead to actually just start a conversation with stakeholders and users. The idea is to also establish the utility and best practices for combining these bottom-up and top-down products to enable a more complete and transparent global stock take. So as we introduced before, uh, the nations of the world are putting together uh, these bottom-up inventories uh, as part of their biennial transparency reports. Now the scientific community is putting together top-down national greenhouse gas budgets for CO2 and methane, uh, and actually other greenhouse gases as well. The hope is that they can be combined uh, as part of the global stock take process uh, as we move forward into the future. We'll be hearing much more about this uh, as we uh, go through the rest of this webinar series in parts two and then in parts three. So let's take a real, real quick uh, look at the uh, net CO2 emissions and removals. CO2 measurements can have been analyzed with atmospheric inverse models uh, to actually estimate the net carbon exchange, uh, uh, which is the net flux of carbon dioxide by all sources and sinks by the land biosphere. And so what we've done is generate high resolution maps with a sp spatial resolution of about one degree by one degree. Uh, we've also not just generated maps of emissions and removals of carbon dioxide by the land biosphere here. We've also actually uh, emitted uh, or, or produced maps of uh, the uncertainties in those emissions and removals, because we believe that these are uh, critical to track as well. The values here that are shown in red are places which are net sources of carbon dioxide uh, by the, from the land biosphere, uh, and the, those in blue are net sinks or places where carbon dioxide is being taken up uh, by the land biosphere. We've taken fossil fuel emissions out out of these calculations uh, to illustrate the effect of uh, things uh, that are basically the, the AFLU sector uh, in, in, um, that we introduced earlier. 
What we then do once we actually generate these high resolution maps at about one degree by one degree latitude by one degree longitude, we then map those quantities into individual national boundaries as best we can. Uh, that introduces a new set of uncertainties. Uh, and we actually continue to track those and now look country by country at the sources and sinks uh, of carbon dioxide. You'll hear more about that process uh, in part two. From that, what we generate are maps of our, our distributions of fluxes for individual countries. The fossil fuel emissions are shown here in red. Uh, the uh, land use change, uh, carbon changes are shown here uh, in this set of experiments. Uh, we then have uh, also lateral exchanges uh, that have to be accounted for in these experiments from rivers and uh, from crops uh, and, and wood exports uh, that are not uh, basically removed from the land but not directly emitted to the atmosphere. So those have to be accounted for. Taking all of these things into account, we come up with a net carbon exchange estimate uh, for each country. Uh, and here shown for the US, uh, India, Indonesia and Australia, and you can see some quite dramatic differences in the relative contributions. For example, for the US, the primary uh, source term is uh, fossil fuel emissions. We see the land actually taking up net carbon, uh, reducing the total amount of carbon exchanged by the system somewhat, so that this number is somewhat smaller than the emissions uh, due to fossil fuels. If you go to a country like India, uh, once again, there's uh, a significant fossil fuel flux. We have uh, fluxes here associated with the land system. Not quite as negative, uh, not as much uptake as we see over the US in this particular case, uh, but we still see some adjustment uh, of the fluxes uh, here in the net carbon exchange. For tropical countries such as uh, Indonesia, we see a, a smaller contribution from uh, fossil fuel emissions, but once again here now the land is actually producing net emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, actually increasing the net carbon exchange and the net amount of carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere by the country. Australia, once again, almost ne a net neutral, small fossil fuel emissions, uh, small land uptake producing almost neutral uh, carbon exchange. We only have these space-based measurements since 2014, so this time series are short, but we can actually compare the measurements from this set of experiments with those reported by the National Inventory Agencies shown here over time uh, for the USA in particular, where there, are, there have been good measurements through this entire time period, or, or good reports through this entire time period, shown here as black dots. We see for Australia also, they've been uh, basically reporting no net change. We've been seeing changes in the system, uh, but once again, uh, with about uh, uh, kind of equal above and below the line here, below the zero line. And also for India and Indonesia, we have space-based measurements, but very few reports of uh, the bottom-up inventories here. One report from India in 2016 was the last one we had when we made this plot. So we've been looking at the land carbon loss as one way of uh, actually uh, addressing uh, the, making a comparison to the uh, AFLU, or, um, the AFLU inventories uh, reported to the uh, IPCC. So that's for CO2. We've done a very similar set of, act we've gone through a very similar set of activities for methane. Uh, there, the number of sources is, is very, very extensive. We have wetlands, we have livestock, we have oil and gas extraction and processing and transport. We have landfills, we have coal mines, we have fires, and actually a whole lot more. But the simpler thing for, for methane is that the actual main sink for methane is actually the atmosphere itself. As, as methane is added to the atmosphere, it's photochemically destroyed over or oxidized over a period of uh, about 10 years on average. Uh, so it goes, that's the main sink. So we're mainly going to be tracking sources of, uh, of methane emissions uh, in these set, of, uh, these set of experiments. So what we've done here is uh, my colleague John Warden has taken the um, measurements made by the Japanese Greenhouse Gases Observing Satellite, GOSAT, uh, and since this particular uh, is, is shown for the four seasons in 2019, we've taken those measurements. Uh, we've actually assist them with a, a flux inversion model and retrieved uh, methane fluxes uh, over country by country over the entire world. And we can then compare those results uh, to the bottom up inventory. So here, what we've plotted is the bottom up results are plotted in orange for 
China, India, Brazil, the US, and Russia, the five uh, largest emitting countries. Uh, and then the top-down results that we've derived from these, these uh, GOSAT measurements are shown in blue bars here. The important things to recognize here is actually there's pretty good agreement between the top-down and bottom-up results. The uncertainties are shown for both. And we see that, for example, for China, the results due to agriculture, um, uh, waste, and fires, when you combine them together, are actually quite comparable uh, and within their error bars. But we see that we see a larger emissions uh, in the, in the top-down measurements on average than on the bottom-up measurements. We see just the opposite for fossil fuels for China. And once again, for natural, we see a, a small uh, difference, but they're basically with the natural sources emitting a little more uh, than the reports uh, are indicating. For India, a slightly different situation. Once again, agriculture is still the largest source. Uh, fossil fuels is a smaller, much smaller source. And once again, a natural source that's uh, looking a lot like the Chinese source. For the U.S., to give a, a counterexample here, we see uh, agriculture uh, and waste and, for, and fires producing a relatively small source, with natural wetlands being the, the primary source here. Then, uh, once again, for countries uh, such as Brazil, uh, we, agriculture is a fairly significant source. Fossil fuels are a very, very small source, uh, uh, actually not even shown here. And then natural sources, uh, primarily uh, emissions uh, from the Amazon rainforest, uh, are actually quite large. The uncertainties are very, very large in that source. In the bottom-up inventories, the uncertainties are quite a bit smaller in the top-down inventories. So we can also, in addition to making measurements at national scales, let's see what we can do for more localized sources. For example, the city. This is my hometown, Los Angeles. Uh, as we fly over it with the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3 spacecraft, we actually can, can sample a region of the entire city. The blue colors here are low amounts of carbon dioxide. The yellow colors are higher amounts of carbon dioxide. And we see much higher carbon dioxide in the center of the city here uh, than in the surroundings, just as one would expect. Uh, and we've used these to, ass to assess fluxes over Los Angeles. Individual large coal power power plants, uh, uh, such as the, the uh, Belchtos power plant in Poland here, we can see the plume of carbon dioxide coming from that power plant uh, quite easily in these OCO3 measurements and other measurements made by OCO2 and GOSAT over time. We also see fossil fuel extraction sites. These are observations taken by uh, the Copernicus Tropomi instrument uh, over West Texas. And we can see the individual sites emitting methane. When you zoom in uh, on a single site using a high resolution uh, uh, commercial satellite called Greenhouse Gas Sat, we can actually image the individual source of most of those emissions, uh, basically a, a, a part of the plant that is leaking, uh, that, uh, leaking methane to the atmosphere. So existing measurements and models don't really have the resolution and coverage needed to track uh, anything but the largest local sources uh, around the planet. Uh, but they do already give, they are already adequate for demonstrating the methods uh, that we, as we've shown here, for tracking emissions from hotspots and, and future, and for future local, uh, global stock takes. As time goes on, the resolution of these systems are going to increase substantially. Uh, the frequency of observation is going to increase, so we can do a much, much better job. The nice thing about these particular emissions is, unlike those from the national systems that I just showed, uh, these are much more source specific. Uh, we can tell that this is from a fossil fuel extraction activity, for example. So we can attribute it to a particular category of a particular sector uh, that the bottom up inventories have to report on. So in principle, these local source measurements could be used in the future uh, to uh, actually improve uh, and inform the bottom up inventories. So we've covered a tremendous amount of material. Let's see what we've learned. In this webinar, we summarize the impact of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases on the planet and on the climate. And the, and the um, We've then introduced the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC, uh, and the primary objectives of its Paris Agreement, which are to renew, reduce net emissions of greenhouse gases and mitigate their impact on the climate. We reviewed methods used to compile bottom-up inventories of greenhouse gases, 
We also showed how top-down atmospheric budgets of carbon dioxide, methane, uh, and other uh, greenhouse gases can be derived from atmospheric measurements using atmospheric inverse models to produce a more complete and transparent description of emissions and removals from local, national, and global scales. We introduced top-down carbon dioxide and methane budgets developed to encourage their use in the first global stock take. These are just pilot products, uh, but they're, they're actually uh, going to be quite useful for actually showing how the, these top-down products can be used. These products will be described in much, much greater detail in part two. Speaking of which, let's see what we're going to be seeing uh, next week and the week following. In part two, we actually talk about how we create top-down atmospheric budgets of carbon dioxide and methane on policy-relevant national to subnational scales. We'll go into the, uh, the speakers there, uh, Brendan Byrne uh, and Dan Cutsworth. We'll go through much greater detail on how these, uh, these uh, measurements are actually uh, derived from um, and, and analyzed to yield fluxes. On May 25th, then, we'll then, uh, I'll, I'll be returning to talk about how the top-down atmospheric CO2 and, and methane budgets can be combined with bottom-up inventories uh, to support a more complete, accurate, and transparent stock take. And so uh, that particular set of presentations, uh, we're in that particular set of presentations, we're going to show that this is still somewhat of a work in progress, and we're going to be soliciting your input uh, over time to actually do a better job here. So with that, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, for your attention, uh, and also uh, start to gather and answer your questions. There's some additional, in addition to the materials that you've seen here, there's quite a bit of additional background information, and in the materials that will be provided uh, as a part of this webinar series, uh, you can access these materials as well and learn more about the topics covered here. And so now what I'd like to do is hand this back to Sean, who will uh, close out this webinar. Thank you, Dave, for such a great presentation and demonstration. As a reminder, here is the contact information for Dr. David Crisp. You can find all the information about the training, including links to download the materials on the training website shown here. And do please check out the many other trainings we have available on the RSET website. We encourage you to follow us on Twitter to stay informed about upcoming trainings and events. We will now transition to the question and answer session of today's training. Please enter your questions in the question and answer box, and we will answer them in the order that they will receive. We will post the question and answer document to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. Thank you for listening, and we will now trans transition to the question and answer portion of today's training. And thank you for everybody that has been submitting your questions. We've been getting some really terrific questions. And uh, why don't we just jump right into it? Uh, so question number one, uh, what are the differences uh, among BTR, NDC, and BUR? OK, uh, these, these acronyms are difficult to trace and track down. And I understand the, the confusion they can cause. Uh, the, the, these are three different re types of reports. Uh, that countries will be uh, putting submitting uh, to the UNFCCC uh, as a, as a part of the stock take process. So uh, a BTR is a biennial biennial, biennial transparency report, uh, and these reports are going to be re now required uh, by all parties uh, to the Paris Agreement, uh, and they include a complete description uh, of not just the uh, the carbon dioxide and, and other greenhouse gas emissions uh, that have and removals that have that have been measured country by country, uh, but also uh, other reports of uh, uh, other information about the uh, 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 the ability of the country to meet its the goals that it specified for itself uh, in in uh, the previous stock takes and in its in the uh, in, in this in the second term here, which is NDC, the nationally determined contributions. Uh, these are predictions by countries are what amounts to a, uh, a uh, it, it's a commitment by a country to work in specific areas uh, to either reduce greenhouse gases or to uh, improve their adaptability and resilience to climate change. And so uh, each five years, uh, countries will submit uh, a, uh, a, uh, an NDC or nationally determined contribution report 
uh, to uh, the uh, to the UNFCCC, uh, and then over the next five years, they'll continue to work toward um, uh, meeting the objectives that they've set, set out for themselves in their NDCs, uh, and that will be reported on with the BT with the BTR with the Biennial Trans uh, Transparency Report. Now, the PURs are something that countries have been submitting now. Uh, Countries in, in the developed part of the world, the so-called Annex I countries uh, from the uh, uh, UNFCCC treaty, uh, have been submitting reports every two years uh, since, uh, since, the, since the early 90s. And those are the BUR reports. And so uh, those reports uh, will are, are kind of, as far as I can tell, being kind of transitioned uh, toward the, B, the BTR reports. So uh, we'll see that. Uh, uh, you know, be basically becoming merged uh, over time. I'm, I'm interested to see how this all turns out uh, as we as we go forward uh, in, in those. So I hope that that answers that question. Terrific. Uh, question number two, what is the height level used to estimate the flux while one uses the satellite data or other measurements? As most of the time, it may not provide a good accuracy at the ground. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, now, first of all, we actually make measurements in different ways of, of the atmosphere uh, abundance of, of greenhouse gases. We make measurements that cover just the ground. We measure uh, make measurements from aircraft that, that actually are making a measurement at the at the altitude that the aircraft is is flying. Um, and then uh, we we. Um, and so when we make a measurement with a satellite, we're actually measuring, uh, getting the average concentration of that gas throughout the entire column, as I described earlier on. So it's actually making a measurement that is telling you what the, how the entire atmospheric column from the top of the atmosphere to the surface and back to the spacecraft, uh, it's measuring an average, the average concentration over that range. Now the measurements uh, from satellite that we're making are most sensitive, very close to the surface, just because of the physics of how these molecules molecules absorb. Uh, so we actually, even though we're measuring the average of the column, we're most sensitive to variations right at the surface. Now, when we're trying to then to, we analyze those data, we use a flux inversion model as explained, uh, and you'll learn more about these in the, in the, second, in the second part of the course. Uh, those models actually will uh, actually have a vertical level structure, and they'll actually uh, resolve the uh, carbon dioxide or methane abundance uh, as a function of altitude uh, in the model, uh, and based on the, the data that we uh, that they obtain from the spacecraft and from other sources, such as ground-based measurements or aircraft that they actually uh, uh, use. So uh, I hope that that answers that question. We make measurements uh, at discrete points in the atmosphere, either at the surface or at, at, at say when an airplane is flying. Uh, we or with a satellite, we measure the total. We get the average concentration to the column, but we then analyze those with a model, which gives us uh, information about the uh, actual vertical structure uh, of the carbon dioxide or, or methane in the atmosphere, uh, it, based on an assumption that the uh, the carbon dioxide or methane was introduced into the atmosphere at the surface. So that's that's the that's the fundamental piece of information there. Now the the um, we can then go back, for example, we can take measurements from a spacecraft and analyze fluxes from that space using that data. We can then go back and look at what the model has predicted for the vertical profile of, of carbon dioxide or methane in the atmosphere uh, from the model. And we can compare that to an aircraft profile uh, of carbon dioxide or methane uh, that was taken in a particular grid box. And we use that technique to validate the measurements uh, to, to, um, to assure their, their quality. So I'm, I'm hoping that I answered that reasonably well. I know that may not have sounded terribly coherent. Great, thanks, Dave. Uh, question number three, what is meant by the fugitive emissions from fuels on slide number 18? Ah, okay. Yes, that's another that's another interesting concept. Uh, fugitive emissions are kind of what they sound like. They're they're emissions that weren't supposed to get away. Uh, typically, when an oil company is trying to extract uh, natural gas, it comes out at high pressure. They try to capture all of it and put it in a pipeline, and that pipeline then carries the gas uh, to uh, a typically some kind of distribution point, and then it gets transported uh, either even larger distances until it gets to a place where it's used. Uh, 
but some of that gas leaks out. Uh, it leaks out either because there's a failure in the equipment uh, that it was put into uh, uh, or uh, some other problem, typically. And so uh, oil companies and, and, and natural gas uh, pipeline companies generally don't like these leaks, They're these fugitive emissions. And if they can be discovered, uh, they fix them very, very quickly because to them, it's it's literally just money going into the air uh, if we have a leak. So they, they do, uh, they're very responsive. So anytime uh, one of our aircraft or one of our spacecraft detect a leak in, a, in an extraction facility or in a pipeline, uh, uh, we do our best to contact uh, companies that are responsible uh, and they are typically are very responsive and get out and fix the fix the fusion tube leaks uh, they, as quickly as they can. So fugitive leaks basically are those that are the leaks that are not intended. Now there are leaks of methane that are absolutely intentional. When sometimes, especially when an oil company is trying to drill for oil, they get natural gas as well. And sometimes they don't get enough natural gas to save or they don't uh, they they're just not set up to save natural gas because they were out after all out drilling for oil. Um, and so in those cases, what they are supposed to do is to light that gas on fire and uh, flare the gas. We, we recall we call it. Um, but sometimes the flare goes out. Sometimes the fire goes out and we'll get another kind of fugitive leak, which is uh, basically supposed to be a flare of leak. Um, and and uh, we'll, we'll see those sometimes as well. A final uh, fugitive type of leak that occurs, uh, occurs not at a, a fossil fuel extraction or transport uh, facility, but instead uh, at a waste uh, management facility, a, a giant landfill. When you put uh, waste into a landfill, uh, sometimes the waste uh, degra uh, basically starts to decompose and that produces a lot of methane gas. But, landfills try to do, uh, most landfills are, are set up to capture that gas and to either flare it or to capture it and, and use it, uh, say, in a power plant. But sometimes that system doesn't work very well either. And once again, we get fugitive emissions. So uh, that's another form of fugitive emissions. But they're, they're uh, something that occurs from time to time, uh, and they're, uh, they, they can be dangerous. And so we look for them, uh, but they're they're always wasteful. And so the, the companies responsible typically uh, will try to find them and fix them. I hope that answers that question. Great, thank you, Dave. Uh, question number four, in reference to the national inventories from the energy sector and the need to track emissions from the transport sector, how are the emissions from the maritime transport sector accounted for at the national level? A uh, very good question. I don't think I have a good answer for you. Um, the uh, for the maritime sector, uh, generally we're referring to bunker fuels. Bunker fuels are typically accounted for either at the uh, the origin or the destination. And it turns out that that uh, different systems account for them in different places. Um, and uh, Let's see. I, or any, let's see. Abhishek is also on. Uh, Abhishek, do you have any other information about bunker fuels? If you're, if you're. Able no, to. I think you covered it appropriately. I would say. Yeah. They're, they're, once again, they're 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 generally uh, not. You know, we we uh, we generally have to attribute them either to the origin or the destination. And like I said, it's it's done both ways at the moment. Yeah, and I mean, the only thing I would add there is that it also depends upon the source of the bunker fuel a little bit. And especially in some of the global emission inventories, they do look at like the source or origin of that bunker fuel and accordingly decides to assign it. Great, thank you, Abhishek and Dave. Question number five, regarding slide 23, I'm curious to know why the latitude gradient of CH4 is so much steeper than the latitude gradient of CO2. Let me very quickly go to slide 23. And while Dave looks at it, I can attempt to answer it. I already uh, answered it on the Google Doc. Um, so the slide 23, I think, flashed by pretty quickly. But the two plots that are shown there for CO2 and CH4, they actually have different color scales. Um, 
uh, the scale for the color ranges, they are slightly different. For CO2, it's actually much larger, spanning over almost close to like uh, 50 ppm, while for CH uh, methane, it's only of the order of like around 0.35 ppm. Um, and which I think it is just like the visualization, the way it is, why it looks like the CH4 gradient is so much more steeper. But just in terms of like magnitude and the actual not south gradient, uh, it's larger for CO2. They're also, these maps are annual maps uh, and uh, they, they were compiled over a period of time. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, if, you, if you also, uh, most of the methane that's emitted uh, comes from land, not from the ocean. And in this particular example that I'm showing here, you'll, the first thing that your eye is drawn to is how in the south we have generally lower methane than we have in the north. But that's largely just due to the fact that there's a lot more land in the northern hemisphere than there is in the southern hemisphere, especially as we head toward the South Pole. So uh, basically, uh, we, we just are running out of the land sources of methane uh, in the southern uh, hemisphere uh, below uh, uh, at, at the latitudes between about 30 and 50 degrees. Uh, and so you're seeing less uh, methane emission there when averaged over the year uh, than you see uh, over the northern hemisphere where there's just a lot more land to emit methane. So it's, it's partly both of those equations. Those are both uh, partially correct. Or contributions, I should say. Wonderful. Uh, question number six. What is the required spatial resolution and the measurement frequency over time to quantify CO2 and CH4? What is the required payload bandwidth range and spectral resolution? Okay, the, the, for, for some reason, the size of the questions on my screen just got shrunken down to a postage stamp, so it's very hard for me to read. Could you go through that one more time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what is the required spatial resolution and the measurement frequency over time to quantify CO2 and methane? And the second part of that question is what is the required payload bandwidth range and spectral resolution? Okay, uh, those are excellent questions. Uh, I can jump in and answer them. Uh, the, the answer is uh, for spatial resolution and temporal resolution, uh, the answer is anything you can, the best you can get. Uh, up to, uh, for, from, from ground-based, you can have sensors uh, that literally surround a power plant, if you, if you could do that. Um, you could benefit from that because then you could capture the plume, you could sample it several places uh, and get a much better description of, of that particular event. Uh, from space, about the best we can do because we're measuring an average between the top of the atmosphere uh, and the surface, uh, Something in the range of one to 10 kilometers is probably the most practical resolution limit that we can come up with, but we would like to get as close to that as we can. The current spacecraft that we have, uh, GOSAT actually makes a, has a spatial resolution. Uh, it, it's single pixel, a single footprint is about 10 kilometers, a 10 kilometer diameter circle. And that's the best we've been able to do with it. And it actually takes observations in that 10 kilometer diameter circle. Uh, they, and then they, the next measurement is on average 250 kilometers away. Okay, so the actual resolution of the system is about 250 kilometers. That's not ideal, but it was the best we could do in the time frame that we launched uh, GOSAT in 2009. OCO2 has somewhat better spatial resolution, um, which is about uh, 2.25 kilometers from one uh, pixel to the next uh, on the ground. Uh, and uh, that was what we could imagine. That, uh, that's what we could manage uh, in the 2014 time time frame. But even there, even though the the it sounds like that's very high resolution, that's along the, the, this narrow ground track that OCO2 measures uh, on the surface of the Earth as it flies over. Uh, and the next track it takes in a, any given day is basically 2,500 kilometers away, a long, long distance away. When we take the data and average over a full 16 days. The spacing between the ground tracks on the spacecraft that the spacecraft acquires are goes down to about 150 kilometers at the equator uh, and, and less everywhere else on the planet. But that's still 150 kilometers, about one and a half degrees of longitude. 
And so that's also not good enough, but that's the best we were able to do in the 2014 timeframe. In the future, say spacecraft being designed to, to make these measurements have a much more uniform and much higher spatial resolution, making me the one measurement or one spacecraft that's uh, on the drawing boards or actually in the, in the, uh, in the factories being built right now. Uh, 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 is a car part of the uh, European Copernicus CO2M spacecraft. Uh, this will be a constellation of two or three spacecraft. Each one of those spacecraft makes measurements with a two by two kilometer footprint uh, over a, about a 400 kilometer wide swath. So that will give us much, much better resolution uh, than we're able to obtain today. Uh, and we'll be getting, basically covering the entire world uh, wall to wall, uh, every place that's not cloudy or dark, um, we'll get about every week or a week and a half. So uh, that will give us much better resolution and we could use all of that resolution. Now, the current models that we use to analyze these data can't fully exploit the kind of data that we're expecting from CO2M uh, over the entire world uh, to, to reduce global flux maps. Uh, and so, Right now, the, the resolution of those models is typically about one degree latitude by one degree longitude, which is about 100 kilometers in each direction. But there, it's still good to have many measurements at high spatial resolution within each one of those model grid boxes to build up the statistics and reduce the random errors from one measurement to another. So uh, they will, even though the models cannot produce a map at uh, a couple of kilometers resolution over the entire world, uh, yet they they can exploit the data uh, at high spatial resolution to give higher accuracy results. So, uh, and then the next question uh, is how frequently do we need that? And once again, we're not there yet. Uh, the current measurements uh, typically have repeat times of on the order of, of one month. Uh, and that's a little bit too long. Uh, CO2 and methane both change substantially over the annual cycle. So we would like to reduce that to something closer to a week. And so as time goes on, we're gonna do our best to improve the measurement system uh, and the modeling system so that we can start reporting out uh, CO2 and methane uh, concentrations and fluxes uh, at about the, the one to two week time frame. And what we're trying to do there is if, uh, even though we're making measurements that are uh, now the getting getting down to precision and accuracy, for OC for for uh, for CO2, we really need to make measurements that are, are at least as accurate as uh, one part per million. And actually, that's not quite good enough um, to to solve many of the problems we're trying to solve right now. Uh, over the oceans, in order to make a meaningful measurement, we need about three tenths of a part per million ac accuracy and, and precision. Uh, there and we're not quite there yet with the existing measurement systems, uh, but we're we're hoping that as we progress into the future, uh, that we have systems that can make measurements with those precisions and accuracies. Um, now, then, uh, the the final part of your question was about uh, the uh, spectral range and resolution that you need to make these measurements. We typically make measurements uh, at uh, over full bands of, of carbon dioxide or oxygen, it turns out. We use oxygen as a reference gas to tell us how much of how, what the total mass of the atmosphere is. Then we make a measurement that's bore-sided with that measurement um, that, has, that measures CO2. And then we can say, uh, we have this much air, we have this much CO2. And so instead of just reporting the total column of CO2, we can actually report the concentration of CO2 uh, in that column. And that's actually a far more valuable uh, measurement when you're trying to get a flux. So to do that, we actually make a measurement over about a 2% wide region of the spectrum. So if we were looking at um, uh, something uh, around, uh, let's say, uh, two microns, for example, uh, wavelength, uh, we would want something that's uh, something like uh, uh, about 40 nanometers across a 2,000 nanometer a wide range. Uh, so we, we have uh, basically, uh, or with a central wavelength of around 2000, 2000 nanometers, we would have about a 40 nanometer wide range. So it would go from, let us say, uh, something around uh, uh, 
2,000 nanometers to 2040 nanometers. So we measure that range. So we take that kind of a spectral range and we divide that into 1,000 pieces typically. So we basically then, uh, and, and so that we have a resolution of about uh, uh, something on the order, uh, typically the, the resolutions that we're flying uh, these days are about 20,000. So we basically, uh, if we're measuring uh, uh, something that's centered near 2,000 nanometers, uh, we make a measurement that's at, uh, something on the order of uh, uh, a half to, to one nanometer, uh, I'm sorry, a, a tenth of a nanometer wide is the kind of uh, range that we will be measuring there. So very high spectral resolution over a narrow spectral range where we just happen to have a carbon dioxide uh, or oxygen absorption band. I, I, I hope that was not too confusing. That was uh, going over a lot of material very quickly. Great, thanks, Dave. Uh, question number seven. How do you specify the space mission and its payloads in accordance with the national needs? Uh, for example, uh, surface number of zones of interest and or facility or regional level? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the answer to that is that it's a work in progress. To date, we really haven't been specifically trying in the in the systems that are flying today like OCO2 and GOSAT and, and tropomi we weren't specifying the system to meet a specific nation's needs instead we were trying to determine how well we could make a measurement to see whether we could make a meaningful measurement these were science experiments uh, and that's how we went forward now what we discovered after we built these systems and implemented them and put them in space uh, is that in fact they were actually providing data that uh, in some cases were better, was better than what we needed to actually satisfy some really critical na national needs. And in other cases, we found that it wasn't good enough. Uh, and so we're now revising our requirements going forward uh, for future spacecraft. Now, keep in mind that spacecraft take five to 10 years to build. Uh, and so many of the spacecraft will be flying in the next five to 10 years. Uh, next five years or so, were based on results and and understanding that was gathered five years ago. Okay, and there, uh, so so we're not quite caught up to where we are today. But for example, I just mentioned that um, to make a measurement that's meaningful, uh, a power plant, a, a very large coal-fired power plant, uh, or a large city like Los Angeles produces a change in carbon dioxide that's only one or two parts per million above the background. Now, we knew that going in because we made measurements from the ground, we made measurements from aircraft, and we saw how small those signals were. And so we initially said, okay, that is our target. We will build a spacecraft that can make measurements of that. But then we find that if you have a, uh, a forest for example, uh, maybe not a very large forest or a cornfield, you would ask, how much does that change the mixing ratio of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as the air blows over that cornfield or over that forest? And you find out, well, sometimes it's a part per million, but most of the time it's a half a part per million or a quarter of a part per million. So we make those measurements also from the ground uh, and from aircraft, and we get insight into these systems, or actually even from OCO2 and, o and GOSAT, what we've been able to do is we've made measurements, we take a measurement, and even though the precision of that individual measurement may be a half a ppm or one ppm, we go and make not one measurement, but hundreds or thousands of measurements over that exact same site at the same time as the spacecraft flies over in about five minutes, uh, over a five minute period of time. So we take all of those measurements and we can produce a measurement with essentially no random error. It, but it still may have uncertainty or error associated with just an error in the model or a bad calibration of the instrument. And so maybe the absolute accuracy is only one part per million, uh, but the relative accuracy of, of, of the measurement is now you know, a 
tiny fraction of a part per million. And so we can make measurements down to that. And we've done that, and we have learned many important lessons uh, about how forests absorb carbon dioxide and how forest fires emit methane and all of these things. And we're using that information and gathering it together and writing better requirements for future missions so that they can uh, meet more of the national needs. The other point to make here, which is an absolutely critical point, is that there were no specifications for atmospheric greenhouse gas measurements uh, from space uh, when we built uh, the GOSAT mission or the OCO mission. Uh, these were aspirational. They were science experiments, uh, and we just were going to do the best we could. Uh, and so as time has gone on, uh, uh, others have, and as, uh, with the Paris Agreement in place now, for example, there are requirements uh, in place that we have to meet. And so we are working very hard uh, to try to design new systems and write requirements for, for new systems that meet very much more uh, well-characterized uh, requirements uh, on precision and accuracy uh, and spatial resolution and everything else. Um, and I think that's going to be an ongoing uh, discussion. Uh, are, are, are others of my colleagues on who would like to add to that? Abhishek or others? No, you captured it succinctly, Dave. Okay, I'm, I'm hoping I can. I, I, I spend a lot of time writing requirements for spacecraft <laughs> based on perceived user needs. And it's a very complicated process. Uh, but I tried to capture at least some of the some of the approaches that we use there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks so much, Dave and Abhishek. Uh, question number eight, what is it about OCO2 and OCO3 that makes them able to be added together? Can you talk a little bit more about why that addition can be done? And does it mean that each data set from OCO2 and OCO3 is less accurate on their own? Thanks. The oh. biggest advantage of adding OCO2 and OCO3 to together is to improve the coverage because they have different ground tracks. So you might have OCO2 flies 100 kilometers to the east of Los Angeles and OCO3 flies right over Los Angeles. If you can combine those two measurements, one can get better coverage of the area. You can maybe use the OCO2 measurement as a background measurement and the OCO3 measurement uh, as a targeted measurement on the city and compare those results to understand how to very, very nicely measure that one part per million difference in, part, in CO2 uh, caused by Los Angeles, for example. So that's the, the advantage. Now, what do you have to do to make that work? Well, first of all, Instruments, especially space-based instruments, aren't perfect, and they don't want to stay perfect once you launch them on a rocket and get them into space. So what we have to do to, to, in order to be able to combine their data together is to cross-calibrate their instruments against uh, accepted standards. And we use multiple standards. For example, both OCO2 and OCO3 have calibrated lamps on board that we can turn on to measure the, the sensitivity of their instruments to light and how that changes over time. OCO2, for example, also can look through a diffuser at the sun, whose brightness is exact, you know, very, very well understood, uh, you know, a fraction of a part per thousand uh, of, of uncertainty in the solar brightness in these bands. So we can get very good measurements of, of, the, of the instrument's performance over time using those kinds of, of uh, results. We also make measurements of well-characterized surface targets. We literally send a team of, of uh, of people out into the field with very sensitive instruments to measure the reflectance of the surface uh, to, to, to sunlight and also to make measurements of the column above it uh, with uh, of, of CO2. We make measurements with uplooking spectrometers from the surface and, and we even have high flying aircraft that make measurements of carbon dioxide over these targets. And one of the targets we like to use a lot is a, is a dry lake bed in Nevada uh, in the US uh, where uh, we make uh, very, very precise measurements of the surface reflectance and the, car and the, the, the atmosphere above uh, the desert floor. And we can make almost nearly simultaneous measurements of 
uh, of that desert floor, that desert target with OCO2, with OCO3, with GOSAT, with GOSAT2, and with tropomy. And we do these campaigns four or five times a year so that we keep these instruments cross calibrated together so that we can understand their measurements. Now, even with that, the measurements still aren't quite perfect. And so we then have to cross validate the estimates of XCO2 or XCH4 that we get from these instruments. And so the way we do that is we, as I, uh, on the validation step, I showed that all of these instruments might fly over a particular TCON station or a particular set of TCON stations. These are total column uh, observing stations that sit on the ground, make very precise measurements. And so then we can compare the measurements that are made, our, our estimate, the estimates of CO2 and, and CH4 that were made over these TCON stations. And, and if there are differences in them, we can correct those differences. And so now we've, we've cross calibrated the systems against known standards so that we understand their measurements. And then we've cross validated the XCO2 or XCH4 uh, estimates that we've retrieved from their measurements to make sure that they're they're uh, as as similar as they can be. Once we've done all of those steps, we can then use combine their measurements, use them together to improve primarily the coverage of the instruments uh, as they fly over the Earth. So I, I hope that that answers your question. Great. And as we are getting toward the top of the hour, uh, what we're going to do is jump down to question number 12. But I do want to let everybody know, all the participants and especially everybody that did ask a question, we will be addressing all of them by next week when we post this document to the training page. So if we did not get to your question today, please don't worry. We will answer it and we will post it to the RSET training page. But due to the sake of time, we're going to go to question number 12, which is, it's an open-ended question. We would love to hear more of an explanation on the technical differences between a greenhouse gas inventory and a budget. Are the different terms just used to distinguish between bottom-up and top-down methods respectively, or is there more nuance? The short answer is there is, there's both a need for different terminology and there's a lot of nuance. These things are really measuring quite different things. Uh, and the inventories can be called an inventory in part because from a given country, I might have 10,000 different sources that are individually measured and added up to give me a inventory of emissions. And then I might have 10,000 different removal mechanisms, different fields or different forests that are being tracked within a country that will be added into this inventory as, a, as an inventory of sinks. So it's truly an inventory, just like you did the inventory of, say, a grocery store, counting the number of cans of, of soup on the, on the counter, the number of boxes of cereal and so forth. So you're doing an inventory. We can't do that with the atmosphere. The atmosphere averages and sums everything together. And if you want to know whether uh, uh, and emissions came from a power plant or the street right by the power plant, it is really quite difficult. So what we do, what we can tell you, we can make a very accurate budget of just the total. So it's like the sum at the bottom of your checkbook, right? It basically is better to be considered as a budget of the total amount of carbon dioxide or methane that was added to the atmosphere. And it's the total net amount because for carbon dioxide, it's added, it's removed. And what we really measure is just the, um, the amounts that's left. And so we're measuring a stock of carbon dioxide as a function of time and looking at how that stock changes. So it's literally a budget of that stock. I, I hope that sort of makes sense to you. Um, in, in, this, in, in it's in fact why we've tried to use this particular terminology because it really does describe what we're doing. Such an yeah, important. And I was just and yeah, please have remind. Me. Oh, sorry, Sean. I was just going to add to Dave's comment by reminding people that Dave had this really nice analogy of the faucet opening and the bathtub filling. And so that's sort of a great way to think about the distinction between inventory, how many times we are opening that tap 
and the budget, which is more sort of the change in stock over time, as Dave mentioned. Yeah, thanks, Dave, and thank you, Abhishek, as well, for the clarification. Such a good question. Um, as we are nearing the top of the hour, uh, we do want to, as we wrap up uh, the first part of this three-part webinar series, we want to thank all the participants today that joined, wherever you're joining from. We hope you got a lot out of today's training, and we hope that you'll join us next week at the same time, next Wednesday, for part two of this webinar series. We want to show deep appreciation for Dr. Dave Crisp, for presenting today uh, such a good presentation, and also uh, both Abhishek Chatterjee as well as Daniel Cussworth uh, for helping out with the question and answer session. So thank you for all of the uh, presenters today and also to the entire RSET team that contributed to this webinar today. Um, Dave, before we wrap up, I wanted to give the last comments to you. If you had any last thoughts or any parting words for the participants of today's training. Well, I want to first of all thank all of you for joining us. I, I hope you got something out of this. Uh, we'll try to answer the questions uh, that you've put in the in the chat uh, over the next few days. Uh, maybe answer them a little. Even the ones that we did answer, we'll try to answer a little bit more completely and maybe even coherently. Um, and I want to encourage you to join us uh, next week at the same time for part two, where we're going to have a, a, a great opportunity to learn how these these uh, top down budgets are created. Uh, and then part three, one week from then on the, on the 25th of May, uh, that's going to be an interesting uh, conversation as well. I think everybody should understand, uh, and you will after we've gone through all of these, that this is somewhat of a work in progress. We're still learning how to do these things, how to create these products, and then how to use them most effectively to meet our needs. We're not suggesting to anybody that the products are perfect at this stage um, and, and that we're 100 percent of where we need to be. Uh, this is still somewhat of a science experiment. And so but what we would hope to find is that over the over the last 10 years, we have learned so much over the next 10 years. We will learn more. And so as we move forward, uh, if you have a good understanding of where we are today and what we can do today, uh, you will have a better understanding of uh, how we can improve those products. And we will actually be listening to you uh, to get your suggestions and ideas uh, for how we can improve these products and make them of greater use uh, for dealing and with and, and, and addressing, specifically addressing national needs. So with that, I'll, I'll thank you all again, once again, for your attention and your time uh, and hope to hear from you again. Great, Dr. Chris, thank you so much for that. And again, for all the people that did ask questions, uh, as Dr. Chris just mentioned, we will be uh, cleaning up this document and, and going back and answering all the questions that we did not get to just due to the con uh, constraint of time. But again, uh, thank you for everybody for joining today, and we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. So be well. Thank you.